Hey, all you cool cats and kittens, it's your favorite history teacher back at you again with another historical video. And today we're going to be talking about another country which we haven't really talked much about until today, and that is Italy and how it was unified. So uh, let me share my screen and we'll just get right into it, um, you know. And uh, let's, let's, let's get into it. Uh, Unifying Italy, Chapter 7, Section 3. Uh, so we're halfway through this chapter's sections that we're looking at. Um, and it's about more nationalism, OK? That was your warm up. OK, objectives, we're going to focus on the effects of nationalism in Italy, understand the struggle for unification and its advocates, and comprehend that revolutions, however successful, will lead to internal problems immediately, especially following unification of Italy. So we got some problems afterwards. All right, Italy's hopes and dreams. Italy had not experienced political unity since Roman times. And by the early 1800s, Italian patriots were determined to build a new united Italy. For centuries, Italy had been a battleground for ambitious, fo for ambitious foreign and local princes. Frequent warfare and foreign rule had led people to identify with local regions, okay? People live in, living in Florence consider themselves Tuscans. Uh, the people in Venice, Venetians, Naples, Neapolitans. However, like in Germany, the invasions of Napoleon sparked dreams of national unity. So this is a map of Italy in the year 1815, okay, when Napoleon was, Napoleon lost at the Battle of Waterloo. So we're going to skirt back. But just know, the Austrian Empire is right here. Von Metternich, all them. Um, and Austria loves some Italy. All right. Lovey, lovey. All right. So as you can see, it's politically fragmented. Piedmont up here. Kingdom of the Two Sicilies. The Papal States, Tuscany, Lombardy. Parma, Modena, and this thing is in my way. Uh, oh, yeah, Venetia, Venice. All right, so crushing those dreams. The Congress of Vienna decided to ignore the nationalists' call to end centuries of foreign rule and achieve unity. To Prince von Metternich of Austria, the idea of a unified Italy was laughable. Uh, at Vienna, Austria took control of much of the northern Italy, while Habsburg monarchs ruled various other Italian states. In the south, a French Bourbon ruler was put in charge of Naples and Sicily. So again, there's no like real Italian Italian leaders. In response, nationalists organized sec secret patriotic societies and focused on expelling Austrian forces from Italy. Between 1820 and 1848, nationalist revolts exploded across the region, and each time, Austria sent in troops to crush the rebels. No rebel rousing here. All right, and so here is a a a um a geez, can I say a anymore? <laughs> a hereditary linear tree of the families of the, the royal f leadership of Europe. And here we have, this is like where, you know, you see um, how these kings and queens are all related. So if you remember, King Louis the 14th, our little sun king back in unit two, okay? And then, you know, Mr. Rococo over here. 
they're all a part of the are they the bourbon family i think they're the bourbon family um and it, it's all intertwined i actually do have this uh family tree of all the Europe, the great European countries in, in the classroom. Um, and it's very, very interesting if you can s understand it and see how related these people actually are. And so why am I, oh, cause this left-hand side right here, uh, I guess I didn't take that out. Um, so there's Maria Teresa, remember? Okay, and Marie Antoinette married King Louis the Sixteenth, and then lost their heads. Okay, so this is where we're kind of at. Um, and you just see the Holy Roman Empire, remember? Holy Roman Empire, Austria, uh, ruling over Germany, right? And they're the ha House of Habsburg, Lorraine. And here you have the Bourbon uh, leaders of Spain. Bourbon Habsburg, you hear those names thrown around a lot. All right, so young Italy. So in, in the 1830s, nationalist leader Giuseppe Mazzini founded this organization called Young Italy, obviously translated. And the hashtag goal of this secret society was to quote, constitute Italy one free independent Republican nation. In 1849, Mazzini set up a revolutionary republic in Rome, but French forces soon toppled it. You know, you can't get rid of the Pope. So the French come in and move them out. Uh, so there's this quote that said, uh, ideas grow quickly when watered by blood, by the blood of the martyrs. And if you can remember back to La Marseillaise, you know, the French national anthem, you know, it's a little bit of like that. So to nationalists like Mazzini, a united Italy made sense, not only because of geography, but also because of a common language in history. Hello, Roman Empire, uh, the most uh, glorified empire in um, ancient, you could almost say in ancient history, uh, where a lot of government styles are modeled after the Romans. So, you know, they got, they got quite a, a history to live up to, right? Um, the glories of Rome, uh, oh yeah, in the medieval papacy, uh, you know, Medici, if you remember him, the Medici family. Uh, it would also, and if, if uh, Italy was united, it would also end trade barriers among the Italian states and stimulate industry kind of like the Zolverein in uh, acted like in Germany slash Prussia. All right, so that's uh, Mazzini and Unione Forza e Libertà. All right, so Risorgimento or resurgence. So after 1848, the, the leadership of the Italian nationalist movement passed to the kingdom of, of Sardinia which included Piedmont, Nice, and Savoy, as well as the island of Sardinia. You have a guy named Victor Emmanuel II, was, a constitution, was its constitutional monarch, and hoped to join the other states to his own, increasing his power. Sounds like Bismarck for the Hohenzollern family. Uh, in 1852, Victor Emmanuel, May Count Camilo Cavour, Camillo Camilo, whatever, however you want to pronounce that, Camilo Cavour, uh, his prime minister. Cavour came from a noble family but favored liberal goals. He was flexible, practical, a crafty pol politician, willing to use almost any means to achieve his goals, kind of like Bismarck using his real politique. When in office, Cavour set to reform Sardinia's economy. He improved agriculture, railroads were built, and he encouraged commerce by supporting free trade. And test question, uh, Cavour's goals to, uh, his long-term goals were to end Austrian power in Italy and annex the provinces of Lombardy and Venetia. And if you recall, those are the like three 
northern northern states in um, in the fragments of Italy. So there we have Victor Emmanuel over here. Look at that mustache, jeez Louise. Uh, then you got Count Cavour right here with the uh, the chin beard. All right, so some sneaky business. I believe this is uh, um, hmm, I don't want to say it. It's part of a test question, I believe. So in 1855, Sardinia led by Cavour, joined Britain and France to help Ottoman Turkey against Russia in the Crimean War. He took Piedmont into the war, sending troops to Russia in the hope of winning a place at the, at the peace table. Oh, I spelled peace wrong. And raised the Italian question at the Congress of Paris. The only way to get Austria out was to use the French army. He therefore developed a plan to provoke war with Austria after having assured himself French military support. And it was easy to gain support from Napoleon III. The Bonapartes looked to Italy as their ancestral country. Remember uh, the island which Napoleon was born on um, is right next to Italy. A year later, war had... Uh, War was had and Sardinia was able to kick out Austria. However, the French were hesitant to continue because years before a French contingent remained in Rome to protect the Pope. Therefore, Napoleon III made a secret agreement that uh, gave Lombardy to Italy, but left Venetia with the Austrian Empire. And the former Italian governments uh, were left to be presided over by Zippo. So... This is after the Crimean War. So you have Sardinia, but here's Venetia up here at the top. And then you got Central Italy. And these are all in uh, French, French, French. Influence is still here in the Papal States. So they didn't really get to kick them out. One Sicily, two Sicily, Sicily, no more. Uh, next. The attention for Italian unification shifted towards the kingdom of the two Sicilies in the south. There, a man named Giuseppe Garibaldi, a longtime nationalist and ally of Mazzini, was ready for action. He received aid from Cavour to recruit a thousand red shirted volunteers. Cavour sent weapons and two ships to take Garibaldi and his red shirts to Sicily the island. And with surprising speed, Garibaldi and his forces took the island, crossed the mainland, and marched triumphantly north towards Naples. So that's our guy, Garibaldi. And here's a picture. Hey, red shirts, two ships. Let's go. All right, test question. Oh, no. So, uh, war and its spoils. Garibaldi's success alarmed Cavour, who feared that Garibaldi, G, a nationalist hero, would set up his own government in the South. So, to prevent this from happening, because you can't, he, Cavour's thinking Garibaldi won't listen to him. To prevent this, uh, Cavour urged Victor Emmanuel to send Sardinian troops to take care of Garibaldi. Instead, the Sardinians overran the Papal States and linked up with Garibaldi in Naples. And in a patriotic move, Garibaldi, G, turned Naples and Sicily to Victor Emmanuel, who thought a monarchy was the best solution to the problem of unification. Plebiscites were held across the country in the two Sicilies, the Papal States, except Rome and Venetia. And they all accepted Victor Emmanuel as King of Italy, 1861. Cavour had died in, uh, earlier in 1861, but his predecessors fulfilled his dream. As a reward for helping Bismarck in the Austro-Prussian War, 
Venetia was then given to Italy in 1866. And when the Franco-Prussian War broke out, French troops retreated from Rome. And for the first time since the fall of the Roman Empire, Italy was a united land. So the last two uh, slides were a test question. Actually, technically the three. Yeah. Because uh, Sardinia was able to add Lombardy to itself. <clears throat> so this is the Italian states in 1858, right? This is the, Ita remember this is the uh, island where um, Napoleon was born. Okay, and then this was the island that he was banished to the first time. Anywho, you don't care about that. You want to know more about this. So all so basically our forces of control are in the light green and they soon after take all of this. Okay. And this is Italian unification, 1870. So you know it happens, boys and girls. It happens. All right. I got 99 problems and they're all Italian. <laughs> bars. Anywho, uh, like in Germany following Italian unification, Italians had no sense of unity. Strong regional rivalries left Italy unable to solve critical national issues. The greatest uh, regional differences were visible between the North and the South. Uh, the North was richer and had more cities than the South. And for centuries, Northern Italian cities flourished as cities as centers of business and culture. And the South was rural and poor. The population did grow, but illiterate peasants could only extract a meager existence from the exhausted farmland. And of course, hostility between newly formed it, the Italian government and the RCC, Roman Catholic Church, further divided its peoples. Popes will resent the land seizures of the papal states, however, the papacy was granted the small territory of the Vatican, and that is, you know, an individual uh, nation state still around today. All right, new government, same issues. Under uh, Victor Emmanuel, the government was a constitutional monarchy with a two house legislature, but it was hardly democratic. The king appointed members to the upper house and they could veto bills passed by the lower house. Uh, Although the lower house consisted of elected representatives, suffrage was only granted to a small few number of men to vote, some 600,000 out of 20 million people. In the late 1800s, unrest increased as radicals on the left struggled against the conservative government. Socialists organized strikes while anarchists resorted to sabotage and violence. Slowly, the government extended suffrage to more men and passed laws to improve social conditions, however, turmoil still continued. To distract attention from its troubles at home, the government set out to win an overseas empire in Ethiopia. Same old, same old. Uh, despite its problems, Italy developed an e economically after 1900. Although it lacked important natural resources like coal, Industry sprouted up along the northern regions. And just like we all know and remember from the Industrial Revolution, industrialization brought on urbanization, of course, as peasants flocked to cities to find jobs. And likewise, reformers campaigned for improved education and better working conditions, blah, bliggity, blah. The same old story, just in a different country. But population growth created social tensions. And there was a safety valve. However, emigration, not immigration, emigration, which means leaving the country. So Italians are going to leave for the U.S., Canada, and other Latin American nations. And by 1914, the country was significantly better than it had been in 1861. But it was hardly ready for the Great War that was about to break out during that year. Yeah, we just... <laughs> so we just kind of covered 
um, Italy from the fall, <laughs> the fall of Napoleon up until World War I. So we kind of covered a lot and it's very generic. Um, however, uh, it, that's nationalism. Italy is now unified. Okay, and that, that was the purpose. That is how it fits under the scene, blah, blah, blah. Okay, uh, your homework is to do page 243 through five. Um, and we'll be having a test shortly, people. Um, so keep your eyes out for that. Um, and yeah, hopefully you guys did enjoy. If you did, smash that like button. It always helps. You know, trying to get Mr. Shiro by a paid YouTuber. <laughs> Anyways, uh, hope you enjoyed it. As always, stay safe, wash your hands. Peace.